If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet, we are back. I'm excited. I have somebody with us, I suppose from the South African Medical Corps or Medical Services. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Her name is Jennifer Barron. And uh, she was a nurse in the army, and at some stage in her career, she was at Free Two Battalion as well. Jennifer, you are most welcome with us here. Thank you for your time. You're one of those who had to wait almost six, seven weeks to get onto the show. Um, I'm sorry, that's the way it goes these days. So can you tell us, where do you come from? Um, so I come from Cape Town mainly. But I was born in Ertsuren because my parents farmed in the Langkloof. And I've lived in a couple of places in my life. And um, now I'm in Barrydale, Afghatria. After yeah, a lifetime of nursing, which I have loved because nursing is the air that I breathe. Well, I think a lot of people will say that the nurse is the closest thing that the human can get to an angel. Would you agree to that? No, you know, I, I don't agree. I think that we, we're all given um, something that we're good at, a gift. So I think, you know, I think teachers are heroes. And um, I mean, being a soldier, going out to war. I, I mean, I just, that's beyond me. I would have been terrified. Um, so I, for me, it wasn't difficult. I think it's just a, a gift that, uh, you know, a, 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 you know, something that we're given. Do you think you can learn that gift or is it something you are born with? Gosh, that's a question. Um, I, I don't know, actually. <laughs> that's a difficult one. I guess one could learn it. I guess one could. But I think it's just was always was what I was in me. So I don't think it's anything special. I just think it's, yeah, it is so what you, it is. So, so you, at a young age, you, you decided I want to go into nursing. Not such a, yeah, there was a toss up between nursing and going to university, but I decided that I wouldn't be very good at studying. It wasn't my best thing. So, and I want, yeah, so I, I opted for nursing and it was a, the best thing I could have done. When was this? When you first went to I nursing started, college? I started training in 1973 and I wrote my finals in 75 and I graduated, yeah, when I was 20. And then the following year, I went and did midwifery in 1976 to 77. Yeah. Now, I have a question about this because I've seen pictures of all these young nurses standing there with a uniform on. They've got some kind of a uniform and they're taking some kind of an oath. Is that true? Yes, it is. I didn't ever attend that because I was in Europe at the time. Um, but they do. They stand there with a little Florence Nightingale lamp and they take the nurse's pledge. Quite right. Now I'm going to ask you the historical question because I love history. Florence Nightingale. I know who she is. You know who she is. But there might be someone here who doesn't know. Can you tell us a little bit about Florence Nightingale? Why is she important to the nurses? Yes, she um, she kind of revolutionized nursing and she she came, I think, from quite a well-to-do family in England and she ended up in the Crimean War, you know, the Crimean Peninsula near Russia or in Russia. And she did heroic stuff, nursing wounded people. And I think she was also credited with bringing nursing from a profession which had been quite rough and you know sort of very rough and ready people entering the the nursing profession to to bring it up to be um a, a good job a decent job and and professional 
I think she, yeah, she made it into quite a professional job. Very dedicated person. Yes, that's a war where the talks of a light brigade took place. Yes. And uh, up to then, it was quite interesting to me. I might be wrong, but I love history. The French army were using their uh, female companions. I don't want to use a worse word than that. As nurses were needed. And, and they're doing it uh... every day. But, but Florence actually came from a wealthy family, as you say, and she decided this is a job, this is a professional mm. career. And from yes. that came what we understand to be nurses and the yes. healing they do. Yes. So how did you enter in the army? So I had been doing, um, working in some labor wards. Um, in the Santon Clinic and the Johannesburg Hospital. And I'd come back to Cape Town and I wanted to, I wanted to live, I wanted to go and work in Hong Kong. So I needed to save money. So I decided to go to Rundu because I thought it's quite remote. Somebody I knew was there and I wouldn't have anything to spend my money on. I could save it and get my ticket and so I did quite well with saving and then I had enough after about a year of being there and the the then medical officers the um, the SMO we called him at um, at Rundu was looking for a nurse at Buffalo and he said to me would you like to do the job so and there was danger pay involved I don't know if I knew it at the time but that would have been an added incentive and um, so I said, yeah, I'd love to. So that's how I ended up at Buffalo. This was the beginning of Buffalo. This was right in the early years. Not really. Um, it was about 1980. You know, and it had been going in the 70s. So, um, yeah, it was along the way. You were quite experienced by then. I mean, you've been practicing your, for a few mm. years. I was about 25. Yeah, I've been practicing for about five years. Yeah. Now I have to ask you, is it different when you treat a soldier, when to treat, let's say, a civilian guy? Are they a different attitude? No different, just another human being. So when you arrived there at, uh, at Buffalo, that is the base of Free to Battalion, what was the in there terms was of infrastructure. there was a, a settlement. There was um, the company commander's house, which was a little wooden house. There was the nurse's house. There was um, a bungalow called the swamp house where the doctors lived, and they and then there was the officers mess, which was very beautiful, overlooking um, the Kavango River and the floodplains. And there was the NCO's mess where we ate. And there were the garages where the, where the, the tiffies worked. And there was the ops tent where we had meetings with the sergeant major. And then there were the lines where the soldiers all lived a little way down the way. And then there was the Kimbo Pikapau where the Angolan soldiers' families lived and they lived. And then there was Nova de Marsu where they did the training down near the Botswana border. Okay. And these uh, Angolans were only speaking Portuguese at that stage. So you had to no, learn a few no, words? No. They also, I did learn a few words, very little, but in, in a little bit, but they spoke English. They did speak English. Mm. Now I have to ask you what. What do you do at a place like that? I mean, it's not that you can go out to the movies or, or anything. You, you, you're basically right out there in the middle of, of nothing, even if it's quite pretty. What did we do? Well, um, we would gather at the officer's mess in the evenings, probably before dinner. I, I can't quite remember. And then we'd all troop up to dinner. And... Something I must tell you, I always remember, if you were standing in a certain position in the, in the NCO's mess before dinner, 
when the bell rang, if you were in that spot, you were the one who said grace. <laughs> so I, I don't know why, it's just something that a memory that I, I have. The things that we did, we would go on the river, we would have um, on boats, we'd just sometimes go and have a bride down at the river, and there was a place called, I think it was called Lekahuki, or yeah, Lekahuki, or something like that. We'd go and have brides there, and uh, the, the guys would play sport, they'd play volleyball, and Sometimes there were running races. Um, I can't think now. You know, it was a long time ago, Chris. It was like 40 years ago. Yes, it's a long time ago. I'm amazed that um, you remember even all those details. Right? But perhaps we can do by, by you telling me, what was your first impressions when you arrived there? I mean, did you go there by vehicle or did they fly you in by the Air Force? Um, I drove by vehicle actually I can't even remember but it must have been by vehicle and I met Esther who was the sister that I was taking over from and she was have to have a profound influence on me she's a remarkable woman her name is Esther Kleinhans she was then she'd been widowed very young and she'd been sent off to Buffalo to have some time out and I think we lived together maybe a week maybe two weeks for the handover and we became firm friends and we still are she's just somebody on a pedestal for me and she taught me a lot and what happened was not long after we arrived one night there was the most almighty racket outside. And the next thing, there were traces flying past our window. It was like there was a war on. And I said to Esther, is this normal? She said, absolutely not. So I said, shall we go and find out what's going on? And she said, absolutely not. She said, we must stay inside. <laughs> I mean, I was so doof. Anyway, we stayed inside and it turned out it was when the when the the, the lads had come back from Ops Protea and they were vus because the major had shut the pubs, I think, to prevent any kind of exuberance because all the companies were out on that operation. I think it was Ops Protea. And um, they were furious. And so they just let rip. So that was quite an interesting, literal baptism of fire. Yes, there's a few ones who uh, were on this very program who told us about that incident. They were quite <laughs> severely <laughs> annoyed. Let's put it like that. Quite <laughs> funny. That. Um, I've spoken to quite a few people in my life. And in the 1990s, there was quite a few books who came out, very negative books towards the army, the old army. And some of them were written by national service people who were uh, medics. And they started talking about the abuse of drugs and where they said they would steal these drugs and they would use it on themselves. I can tell you in my years on the border in the police, I've absolutely never seen such crap. And the army had uh, fantastic procedures in place for what happens to its drugs and its medicines and its pills. I wonder if you can, as a professional, just tell me, these, these people, I'm not calling them liars, I don't know what happened with them, but would it, would it have been easy for you to abuse the drugs in the army and get away with it? I, um, I certainly wasn't aware of any of that. Um, where, there, where there was a problem was that bags went missing in battle. You know, they got shot off them or they had to run away or whatever. So it was quite difficult to keep track of the drug that they used for pain was Sosagon. And you know, you have to keep a register in that. And I remember that was tricky because, simply because I think of being in battle, you know, the, that, that what happens in battle, you know, the, the whole bag would go. So 
that's that's all that I know. But I was not aware of. Um, I wasn't aware of abuse of drugs. It may well have been, but I certainly wasn't aware of it. It was just the thing of like I, I think once there was there'd been river crossing or something in the war in Angola and bags had gone missing and you know it was that kind of thing it was part of war well i suppose that can happen but these people are talking about not bags missing they just abusing you and i don't believe in well, are they world. saying that are they saying that soldiers abused it or the doctors abused it well they say the soldier himself like a medic who's not a doctor but he's like a trained medic and then he would use yeah. these these drugs uh, for party purposes well I, I don't know how they'd get around that because you have to keep very strict records you know unless they cheated the records i don't know but i i, I certainly wasn't aware of that not at 3-2 i've seen a few army doctors in my life there's many jokes about them mostly aren't true they would be assigned to us in the police, and I must tell you, they've done fantastic work. They were really good people. They Our came, doctors, yeah. Yeah, and, and there was just one funny one. He told me this joke. Well, I hope it's a joke. He said to me once, how do you prevent somebody from screaming out aloud if you have to operate on him without any such again or, you know, what? Mm. to put him out? And I said to him, well, he was a major at that stage. I said, major, I'll kick him in the head, you know, or something, you know, just to make him unconscious before. Knock uh, him out. Yeah, knock him out. So he had a different idea. He said, no, no, that's not the way to do it. What you do is you just, you just tell him to, to take a deep breath. And I said, what the hell will that help? And he says, well, the moment he takes a deep breath, like inside in his lungs, he starts cutting. And I said, no, what the hell will, will that tell? And he says, well, logic should tell you that to shout air has to come out. And if he takes a breath in and you start cutting, the shock will just, on the body will just cut him out. And I looked at this fellow and I thought to myself, you must be insane. And then he started laughing. And I realized he was telling a joke. Um, so that's my only story which I know about army doctors. I don't know if you have any others for us, because I do know there were quite a few we assigned to, to the different units. Yeah, the doctors at 3-2 that I worked with were superb. They um, were very professional and they were great guys. The only thing was, I remember one lot, I can't remember which ones, but we had the ambulance was a Unimog. And they drove very fast and I was very scared. So I said to them, I think I'll be the driver now. So I used to drive the Unimog. And um, they were quite happy with that. And the other thing was, the other thing was, the doctors got to ride in the helicopters and have little flips when the pilots came. And I was always in the Kimbo somewhere else. And all I wanted to do was to have a little ride in a helicopter. I'm still waiting to have a ride in a helicopter. <laughs> So I was well, just jealous. <laughs> we will definitely tell any Air Force person looking here. We've got a nurse who wants a, a yes. helicopter, right? And you better go and arrange it for us. <laughs> <laughs> but how did it come that you could drive a Unimog? I mean, that thing is quite big. It's not a car. Ach, but they're easy to drive. The thing that I've battled to drive was the Biffle because you sort of lopsided and then you end up driving on the middle maneki because you're not quite... No, it was easy to drive. These doctors, were they all um, drafted in from the National Service side? Or were they, some were. Of them... they were. They had to be there. They were, you know, they were just doing their National Service. And they were great guys. They did, you know, they'd, they were young doctors and they did really well. Very professional. Would that include like a surgeon? Were you able to treat serious cases or would they be evacuated? Yeah, they did do surgery, you know, little surgeries. I remember one chap, um, they were doing river crossings and the propeller sliced his buttock. And they did a magnificent job scrubbing it clean and, you know, under anesthetic and stitching him up beautifully and it never went fraught. 
And um, I think they did, you know, small things. We had the hospital was made of corrugated iron. It was jolly hot. But um, they were very, they were top class, well-trained young men. What is the relationship between a nurse and a doctor? I'm not talking romantic. I mean, there's enough of that. But who's, who's really in charge? Because I've met some veterans who, who put the fear of God into me. Yeah, me too. Um, well, you actually a team. You know, you're supposed to work as a team. And um, I think it's changed a bit now. But the way I trained was that you, you were there to help the doctor. And, you know, everything to help get the patient the best treatment. So whatever it required to help the doctor, you know, you did. But it seems a little bit like there's more division of labor and the nurses, sometimes I had the impression when I was working that they were more militant and had rights. And maybe also because in those days, women were not so emancipated almost, you know, we were, well, it was the 80s and or the late 70s and feminism was really emerging and that, but I think I was still, I, yeah, just help the doctor, whatever is required, you know, to get the patient better. You've learned a set of skills and the doctor has, has his skills and um, he's actually the ultimate in the saying of what's what because he's studied, you know. He knows a body inside out. Nurses don't, or I didn't, you know. They're the doctor. How important is aftercare? It is important. Of course, it's very, very important. Um, you know, a few years ago, I went to a course on pain management. And um, the lady who gave the lecture, she was saying that if you greet a patient and you say, hello, Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so, and you say their name and you look at them and you engage with them and you, you know, are genuine, she said it's equivalent to a shot of morphine. And to me, that says a lot, you know. That's, so, so there's a lot to healing, you know, um, and aftercare is, is very important from both the doctor's input and the nurses and family, you know, the whole thing, physios, the whole medical team. Do you still practice this in this? No, I retired last year um, in last year. No, the year before, the year before when I was 60, we yeah, are 65. I, I retired, yeah. Would you say today that if there's a young woman or man listening here, is that a good career choice? A nurse, 100%. Yes. Wonderful. If Only if you want to be. If, you, if you're not so keen on it, don't be a nurse. Because, yeah, it's like any job. You know, don't, don't do something that you don't love because maybe you won't do it as well. Definitely. I have no regrets. Is there such a thing as a patient who is um, difficult, who just refused to listen to you? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I think, you know, it's the old story. It's how you treat somebody. They will respond accordingly. And especially when somebody is ill, they're very vulnerable and very exposed. And their bodies are exposed. They're just like vulnerable, they're sick. So uh, it's an enormous privilege to be a nurse or a doctor or a physio because you're dealing with somebody's body often in, in an exposed, maybe a naked body and they're really, you know, in your hands. That's quite something. I wonder if you can tell us what a typical day at uh, Buffalo would look like. From the moment you wake up? Um, I think we used to do ward rounds. I'm pretty sure we did. We did with the doctors. And then we would go to the Kimbo, 
because we did a lot of vaccinating. We'd go with our little polystyrene cool box with all the vaccines and there were records and you vaccinated the babies. And if the mums forgot, the MPs would go and find a mum and bring her in with the baby. And then there was a lady called Donna Beer, who was the midwife. She delivered all the babies, the normal vertex delivery babies and Donna Beer. Um, and then I guess we would come back and work in the hospital some more. It's terrible. I can't really remember so well. well it was a very a long time. Right. Yeah, it was a long time ago. I just remember it was very, very hot. And going out to the Kimbo, hot and dusty, on the back of a bedford usually, or something like that. Were you never scared of being attacked by the terrorists and being abused? No. No, because I don't think there was any danger. And also, you know, when you're young, you, I think you don't think of those things. One, once when I was there, there was a complete blackout because they'd got a signal saying that Buffalo was going to be attacked. So we just had to make sure all our windows were dark. But even that didn't frighten me. I don't know. I think, I think it's, that's a, a thing of youth. You think you're immortal. I'd be very scared now. <laughs> well, it's a funny thing, you know, you look back and you say, I'll never allow my child to take such chances. But then you don't quite understand why your parents were so, not unhappy, but, but worried about you. Or perhaps you do understand it when you look back with age. No, there was, a, there was an incident once where um, the, the houseboat, that the three two guys had captured in Angola or wherever and was in their possession had broken its moorings and drifted down the river. And so a couple of us got in a speedboat to go and look for it to see if it had lodged against the side or if it had gone through to Botswana. And we got close to the Botswana border and they started firing at us, the BDF, the Botswana Defense Force. And Jim actually got a a, a bullet grazed under his chin. I've never seen a wound bleed like that. It was just a graze. Anyway, um, it was quite an incident and um, we turned around and sped away and the bullets were plopping in the river around us. And I sent a parcel home with one of the soldiers to Cape Town to my parents and he told them all about this. And my poor parents, if I think about it now, I don't know what I put them through when I was young. Anyway, yeah, that was an interesting thing. I'm wondering if the chaplains played any role there at the hospital. Huge. Well, not at the hospital, in the whole base. Um, um, Germany Tauti, Marnie Tauti was the Germany, a wonderful man, and his wife, Haneli, Haneli. And Anneli was just the most extraordinary woman. She used to hold a Bible study for us. Um, she was the most gracious, gentle lady. And he was a really godly man. They both were. How hard is it to treat a bullet wound? You know, we didn't treat, uh, at Buffalo, we didn't treat um, war, war casualties. They all went to, um, uh, not on Dungwa, what's the other place? Oshikati, or, I think, or to One Mill. We just treated um, diseases on the base and minor accidents and minor surgeries and things. So I don't think I ever saw a bullet wound, actually. Yeah. Okay. Were you ever homesick? No, I was 25, you know, and it was exciting. And um, I came from a very happy and stable home. And they were always there. And uh, they would always be there. So, you know, uh, not at all. It was a jolt, really. How long did you stay there at Buffalo? 
I think I was there for just under a year. But I, I, something that I, I, I must tell you about, um, the, the guys would always drink a lot because there wasn't much to do. And I remember saying to um, Scruffy, who ran the, or he was certainly part of the training area in Novodomarsu, I said to him, why don't you build a hide? And, and you can go up there and watch the animals and the birds and from your little hide. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then every now and again, I'd say to him, so how's the hide coming along? He said, yeah, 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 it's fine. It's fine. It's coming along. This was months and months. And then one day he said, you must come down. I've got something to show you. And he, they had built this beautiful little tree house. He said, here's your tree house. So it wasn't for them. They built it for me. Or it seemed to be. And it was so sweet. And many years later, I I had a, a I met a man who was in conservation in Namibia then. And we were talking about up north and 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 the, the Caprivi. And he said, you know, I was in the bush one day and I found this platform, this remains of a tree house. So I said, hmm. And I said, tell me more. And we were chatting. So I went and fetched a picture of it. So he said, that's it. He said, it's just the platform left, but it's still there. I don't know if it is now. I recently went to look for it, but we were in a two by four and we got stuck. So we didn't get that far. I still want to go and find it. I'll oh. have to go in a four by four. But yes. it was amazing because you'd be in that tree house in the evening and the hippos would be going oink, oink in the river and the drums the Bushmen beating the drums in Botswana, you know, 24 hours, just beating, beating. It was an extraordinary experience. A huge privilege to, to have that. Yes, people are paying a lot of money these days to go to those yeah. areas. Yeah. I think there's this uh, five-star lodge or something just across from where Buffalo used to be. Yes, in Gepe. I, I camped there two years ago. It's very nice. Yeah, then any strange feelings? You look across the river and... I went to Buffalo. I went. We went and we walked around. A very peaceful, very quiet. There were a few buck grazing. And um, I walked through the ruins. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't find the parade ground. And I, I was a bit disorientated because the landmarks, some of them were gone. Um, yeah, but it was it was very lovely to go back. I enjoyed it. Can you tell me what was these uh, diseases which your people were treating at Buffalo itself? Uh, something like malaria? Yeah, a lot of malaria. If if I remember, I, I tend to get muddled up between Rundu and and Buffalo, but um, certainly there there was malaria and probably TB. There was definitely a lot of TB at in Rundu. Um, yeah. Something that I remembered there, which I kind of think we as Caucasians or Westerners can learn from is if a baby died, which I remember once a baby died, the women mourned in such a way that they, wailed and they they you could it was just huge outpouring of emotion and I remember thinking what is that sound and then realizing what it was it was quite extraordinary I think that um, we sometimes forget that even if we don't look the same we're still human beings we're still children of God we are the same we're brothers and sisters, you know, bottom line. But I think as Westerners, we've lost a, a, an element of our spirituality or our the mystic side of, of spirituality. And like things like that, outpouring of, you know, raw emotion. We tend to, you know, I think, got a it in sort of thing. Yes, anyway. the old uh, British stuff, upper lip. Yeah, yeah. And my heritage is all, yeah, yeah. 
that's not a good thing health wise i think um no, it's not. Not good to show emotion isn't it definitely i mean we're not to be ruled by our emotions and but we have emotions for a reason definitely were the nurses ever supposed to attend the parade the morning parades prayer parades or would you go yeah, directly we, to your job we did go we went to church parades we did go to parades i always used to go down to the parade ground when the troops were going off to war i would just go down and say goodbye um yeah we did as far as i remember would you then be wearing a uniform or be in your nurse's clothes it was a bit peculiar you know i went from rundu to buffalo so i never did basics I was never issued with a uniform. I just had a white uniform with a belt and sandals. And my ep I don't think I even wore my epaulets because for a long time I didn't have the nurses' military epaulets, you know, because you, you become a, a two-star lieutenant if you're a qualified nurse. But they were slightly different to civilian epaulets. So it was quite informal. I think because you know the whole thing about three two was that it was clandestine initially, and um, very informal. So, and occasionally I would I had a pair a set of Browns, and occasionally I would put them on if I went shooting. You know, practice shooting. I remember once or twice with the guys, and they used to laugh when they saw me in Browns. They just used to throw back their heads and have a good old laugh. <laughs> So you would be entitled, I suppose, to a special Frito Battalion Beret, which looks unlike no, anything. No, 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 I wasn't. I was definitely SAMS, the South African Medical Services. That was my unit or whatever you want to call it. So I was never, never, never 3 two. It's just by grace that the guys invite me to their reunions and that sort of thing, which I really appreciate. Now that I'm would not... be, that's a red beret, I believe, not maroon, it's red. Yes, we have It's got a like a little beret. snake thing on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The medical thing is a serpent, yeah. Now the medical core, I'll just explain this to people who is, was not familiar with South Africa, perhaps, is that the Defence Force was and still is divided, I believe, in four different parts. You know, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and then the Medical Corps yes. on its own. You were never trained by them. You were trained in a civilian hospital, and then you yes. became a nurse. Yes. Is it possible that somebody can go the other route, you know, enlisting the Army? And then yes. end up in uh, and be trained like. It, it, certainly, in my day, you could. I don't know about now, but um, doctors and nurses could do their training through the army. Yeah, but I trained at Krutuskia was my alma mater. Um, but you could go to like Tumil and train to be a nurse in those days. I don't know now. Well, Grotteskir is quite a famous hospital, isn't it? That's where uh, it Professor is. Barnard. Yes. And still, they do incredible work, um, uh, it, it, despite sometimes difficult circumstances, you know. Um, but in its head, I trained in its, what I would say was probably its heyday in the 70s when we had lots of resources, probably at the expense of three quarters of the population, but be that as it may, it was a very good hospital. It was also very big. I think um, yeah. it's, it's possible to get lost in it. Uh, yeah, except when you know it, you know, it's not, yeah, it's quite big. I think Barra is far bigger. Yeah, that's Paraguana. I believe it was one of the top five biggest hospitals in the world. Yeah. And I think the biggest in Africa, maybe. Yeah, most certainly the biggest. I also know there's lots of uh, European trained doctors, surgeons and things coming down 
the train there because there's so many knife attacks and unfortunately the trauma. gunshots, trauma. Terrible. I don't know what's wrong with us that we can't get that right in our country. It's a, a great tragedy that we're so violent. Yes, I spoke to a Botswana Defense Force officer once and uh, he said to me, you South Africans, there's 50 million of you and all of you are angry. <laughs> but I never really thought <laughs> to me, I didn't, I didn't think like that. And then it suddenly struck me, yeah, these people, we, we should just calm down. We should just yeah. calm down. Yeah, love each other. It's as, for me, it is as simple as that. Well, that's what it all comes down to. If you love each other, you will not have any problems with each other, will you? Yeah. And also the, the, the war, the war, the border war. Um, I'm a pacifist. Then I don't know that I was anything. I was young. But if you think about it, it's politicians just sending young people into war you know, whether they like it or not. It's, um, and yeah, that's, that's quite a thought, you know, and to stand out and, and maybe be an objector takes huge guts and courage. Uh, yeah, anyway, it just seems, you know, if I think back about the young boys who died, I feel ill, you know. Well, you know, even the enemy had mothers and fathers. It's interesting to me too. Say again. I say, say even again. the enemy did had mothers and fathers. Exactly. Exactly. You know who said that was a, a young woman, a young Jewish woman called Etty Hillison in the Second World War. And she was she died at Auschwitz, but they found a lot of her writing. And she said those German mothers and fathers are mourning their young sons who've died just the same as the other side, you know, and that's the truth of it. I think it was uh, General Ulysses S. Grant, he later became president, Civil War, U.S. Civil War. He said there was never a, and I'm just quoting him out of memory, it's not word for word correct, before I get nasty letters here. But he said something like, there was never a time that you really need to take your sword, sword out of its uh, sheath. Um, you could have talked it out. And sadly, it seems to me that the politicians are quick to start something which uh, somebody else has to go and die for. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. But nursing as a profession is a healing profession. But I have to ask you, does it not get to you at some stage? I remember in the police, we used to say that there's only one good woman we can marry, and that's a nurse. The other one would be a police officer, but she's straight, she can kill you or kick your ass. So the nurse was the safest option. According <laughs> to us, we were young men. I apologize if I insult people. But the police changed you because you worked with these horrible things all your life. And then after a while, something starts changing in you and you, be, you, you lose some of your humanity. That's according to me. Once again, only me. I might be wrong. But is there the same type of thing inside the nurse where you feel that one day you feel it's, it's just too hard? Um, no, I didn't ever get to that point because I think that I didn't ever work in like the hospice work that I did. I did it in two patches and it wasn't for a very long time. So I didn't get to that point, I don't think. But I guess it can happen. But um, nursing was not hard for me. I have to say that. There might have been times when it was a bit tough, but um, that's not my overriding memory of of my time, my working life. Not at all. Do you think there's enough nurses right now in South Africa? I, d I don't. I, I don't really know. But there was a time when there were 
big nursing schools like when I trained and lots of girls went from school to nursing. And now my children's generation, I don't know, not one of my children's friends or my children have become nurses. Um, so I don't know what's going on. And a lot of the nursing schools closed down, just doesn't seem all orderly like it used to be. Um, I also have a sense that young people want to earn lots of money. I think we've become very, uh, I'm really generalizing hugely, but I think um, our world is way more materialistic and avaricious and wanting stuff than when we were young. I sound like a, an old, don't know what, when we were young. But it was different. You know, you didn't think about what you're going to earn. You just thought about what you could do in life to contribute to the planet, I suppose. But I think young people are quite focused on, well, I think it's the world, the way the world is, you know, with, with all the, the social media and all that stuff. And this stuff, stuff, it's about stuff and not about connection and about human beings, you know. And kids are isolated with their social media. And as, as much as it's brought a lot of good things, it's, it's come at a cost as well, I think. I have to agree with it. And I also think, or well, I know, uh, that a lot of South African medical people were recruited to go to the Middle East or to other countries. And, and that also did not help the local situation. Yeah, yeah. We've lost a lot of, of medical people. Yeah. So when you, when you left Buffalo and you became part of a normal medical corps, medical services again, is that a big change? Not really. I went to one mill for a brief time and worked in the labor ward there. No, it wasn't a big change for me, I don't think. I can't remember that it, that it you know, was. Now that you talk about the labor ward, I recall that um, in the police, I was in a flying squad and we had to escort a uh, vehicle into the hospital with a woman in labor. And then certainly she didn't, uh, well, the baby didn't wait. Now the moment the baby were fine, but then they wanted to call this poor child something like uh, Romeo Four, whatever the car who was escorting the call sign was. <laughs> and I'm sure there's quite a few Christmas shabalalas or something out there. So I have to ask you, um, any babies which you assisted with is called after you? Because today grown people with their own children. I think there was one baby that I heard of that the that the person I think it was when I was a student that they called their baby after me. And I was only a student midwife, but I must have delivered the baby. But what they did do, there was um there was a drug called Ipridol that we used to use. I think it was to stop labor. I can't remember now. And they, they would call their babies Ipridoli. And um, there was another drug too. I'm trying to think what it was. And they'd also like make it into a name, which was quite sweet. Yeah. Yes, I recall my father telling me once he was a, a regional magistrate at the Stern Man. Really, you made no jokes in his court. Don't even think about it. Really. God will not help you if you try to make a joke in that much court. And so, uh, so he had a translator there and they were quite close to each other. So this guy decided he's going to call his eldest son after my dad. And I recall my father was quite happy about this. He expected him to be called Kurs. But in fact, the name which came out was Magistrat, like Magistrate. <laughs> oh, funny. What a hoot. <laughs> and as far as I know, it's actually a true story. But I find it fascinating. But I find it fascinating talking to you because is there anything 
in jou career as a nurse, um, would you wish to share with us something which is perhaps funny or something which is perhaps less funny, but we can learn from it? Um, well, I think I've said already what, what I think, that it's an enormous privilege to be a nurse or a doctor. My husband's a vet, and he always says it's a huge privilege, you know. Um, and, yeah, do it if you, if you want to. But if you don't want it, then it's not going to be nice to do. Um, but it's a great job. It's a great job. And there's so many different aspects. There's so many ways you can perform your job. And um, I have loved it. I really have. I suppose every house should have a small medical kit with it. But would that help unless you have some even basic medical training? Would, would, you, would you agree if I say to you that somebody listening here, perhaps it's a good idea just to go to St. John's or whatever. Yes, and yes, just get yes. that basic training. Absolutely, you can save somebody's life, for sure. If you know how to do... Um, um, you know, what do you call it? You know, the, the resuscitating story. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I, I, I wrote down a few funny stories that I wanted to tell you. Can I tell it? Yeah. Please so, share with us whatever you want. We're listening. Okay. So um, the one was uh, the guys, I don't know what the circumstances, but it was a group photograph they were going to take with a little automatic camera that spat the picture out straight away. So, and they wanted me in the front at the bottom. So I sat there all very primly with a big smile on my face in my little white uniform and all these army boys around me. And we all smiled at the camera and they took the picture and then out it came and they showed it to me. And in the back row, there was an American guy who, I don't know what he was doing in three, two, Chris Clay. He dropped his drawers, so he had pulled his brooks down. I can't remember if he was naked or if, if he was in his underwear, but it was quite a funny picture. Me sitting there, smiling very politely, and this going on behind me. And then there was another incident where um, in the night, I woke up with somebody at my feet, and I, I got a bit of a fright, and I woke up and I put the light on, and there was a young soldier, and he was in his drunkenness. He was saying, oh, sister, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. He said, and I think he was looking for a bed in the hospital because sometimes when they drank a bit too much, to walk down to the company lines was not a good idea, and they'd try and get a bed in the hospital. And the next day, I think he came to me, and he said, I am so embarrassed, and I'm so sorry. I said, please. Who of us hasn't done whatever in our life? But this poor chap, he was so scarm about it. It was quite funny. And then um, another funny thing was when um, I had been at Buffalo a little while and I used to drive the medical Gary. And then the, the, one of the company commanders, Jim Ross, arrived. And he wanted to, I think, get to know me a bit better. Is maybe a way of putting it. And he, he said to me, um, I, I'm appointed your driver because um, you don't have a military vehicle driver's license. So I have to drive you around. So I thought it was quite a clever way of getting to know somebody. Smooth talker. <laughs> and. The other funny thing was that the boys all drank beer or rum or whatever they drank. And I used to drink gin and tonic and, and wine. You know, growing up in the Cape, that's what we drank. And there wasn't a corkscrew often. They could never find a corkscrew in the, in the mess. And I don't know if I already knew or if somebody at Buffalo taught me, but somebody along the way taught me how to get a cork out of a wine bottle without a corkscrew. 
So that became my party trick. You, 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 you take a knife and you stroke the neck of the bottle and it hits the rim and then eventually it'll thud and it, it makes a crack right around the neck and you just ease it off. I think I learned it at Buffalo. Somebody must have taught me that. Well, I was thinking of it. I've heard about this American officer. Apparently, he was quite a good guy, but he was also into pole dancing. Um, oh, didn't know that. Well, there's a story about that, but I'm not going to repeat it. I was told about it off the record, so I won't say more than that. Yeah. We have to remember, of course, that in those days, there were no, um, what do you call it, internet cameras or these phones yeah. or things like that. Yeah. You, once you were out there, you were on your own. Yes, yes. The other, another nice thing to, to talk about is the breakfasts were fabulous. There was this wonderful head chef called Jumbo, who I'm sure people have spoken about. And you could go and choose how you wanted your eggs, a beautiful fluffy omelette or a fried egg or a poached egg or whatever. I mean, this just blew me away. <laughs> I, thought it, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. And another funny incident which I, well, it's not so could be funny, but um, we were in the uh, in the in the company commander's house. A group of us chatting, and um, one guy took might have been Jim Savory, but I can't remember if it was him. But he took a hand grenade off the wall, and there's a chap called Patrick Corbett. And Patrick, he's big guy. He stood up and he said, "This is how accidents happen." And he started walking out and I jumped up and I followed him. I thought, I'll just stick with you, mate, because I think that is how accidents happen. Anyway, it was a, a, a not a loaded one or whatever you call it, but I always remember that stuck in my memory. Were you yeah. ever, ever issued with a for, for firearm for, for personal protection? Yes, I had, a, I had a nine mil parabellum star, which I, used to be able to pull apart and put together and fire. Not that I ever did fire it or use it. I did, maybe I was taught to, to shoot, but yeah, never needed it. So, people are asking me, you know, they write to me privately sometimes and they wanted to know if there's a lot of snakes in that area and if so, were these snakes ever aggressive? Would they try and attack somebody? There were snakes, um, but um, mm, I only remember one incident where Jim had ca he'd captured a snake, or and he had it in an ammo case, and he was very naughty because he called a troop over and opened it and showed him. And these poor troops, they were petrified. This guy, he ran so fast, he tripped. He was so desperate to get away from the snake. I've actually got a picture of it. Um, oh, I think it had been under somebody's bed. This guy said that the, his poster next to him kept rattling. And then he discovered, and I think Jim was called to, to extricate it or something. Yeah. But I personally didn't have any real incidents with snakes except met that one. Oh, and the funny thing was I was being relieved or, or another sister had come to join me, um, Tersha and Jim phoned and he said, I've got a tall, dark, handsome stranger to meet you. His house was next door to us. So I said, I know it's a snake. And he didn't say anything and he came and it was the snake and this young this woman Tersha she was terrified and she hauled out her nine mil parabellum star and she said Jim Ross if you come any nearer I'll shoot you <laughs> I think she meant to do because he had this great big wonder what it was a python sort of you know sort of wrapped in his arms holding its head and she was not impressed at all yeah, I have so my... much sympathy for that woman. Yeah. You know, there was this old advertising in South Africa, something about give that man a bells or something. Give that woman a bells. Yeah. I will definitely shoot that guy at this snake. <laughs> and... Yeah. Because I'm scared of snakes. 
I will be your first one to admit that. I had to yeah. feel incidents with him, but I'm very um I'm very um respectful of them and careful. Give them a wide berth. Something else I, I would like to say, course, that I think is very important is that I felt very um I felt like the guys carried us nurses on the palm of that. They were so respectful and so um, treated us so well, you know, in spite of their rough life and the things they had to face and do, they, um, they were incredible. One never felt uncomfortable or scared or they just um, honored us as women if you like and we're really uh, across the board all of them the troops the NCOs everybody and I think that's quite a, an important thing to mention yeah. I think so too I was about to ask about it because you know you're young you're 25 years old you're blonde blue eyes mm -hmm. I think Mm. And now you're there with all these men. And uh, yeah, I, I was wondering if I, you know, sometimes no, got never, the wrong ideas or, or overstepped no, the boundaries. Never, never, ever. I never felt awkward or in a bad situation. Ever. Yeah. No, I think if there's anybody listening, yeah, I would call that discipline. That's fantastic. Because these are young viral men and they're far away from home. They're obviously in a war situation. They're not angels. They're just mm -hmm. normal men, you know, they've got desires. And yet they treated you people like very, very well. Yeah, yeah, they did. They really did. Were you all alone there as a nurse or were you always a nurse, other nurses with you? Uh, for a while I was alone after Esther left and then Tosha came. I can't remember how long the time periods were. I have to say we would love to speak to Esther as well, if she's willing and listening. Well, she may perhaps. well be. She she's retired now too. She lives in Pretoria, and I can I can ask her. Yeah, the wonderful. We, we would be most grateful, you know, to hear the different stories and angles and views. Mm -hmm. That's how you find out history. I mean, you don't listen to just one person. You you get yes. an overview of people and then yes. different heroes. And you fully understand. Is there anything which you would say, looking back now, which the army perhaps could have done differently in terms of um, training or perhaps uh, equipment? Because I rate the South African Medical Services extremely high. But training or equipment. Um... I don't think we lacked any equipment, but you know, it was so long ago, I can't really remember. Um, certainly, I remember food was in abundance and like um, we would take jars of peanut butter to the mothers in the Kimbo, which is a good protein for the children. I think my general impression is that there was enough of everything. I know that you people never worked with casualties as such, with a trauma. Mm -hmm. But I just want to, to mention here yeah, that the medical services did very, very well with, with trauma. Yes. And uh, they had that golden hour story sorted out. And mostly, I would say almost always, um, the helicopters would fly in and they would evacuate whoever is yes. wounded. There were no yes. difference between black, white, pink, or enemy. Yeah. Everybody yeah. got treated the same. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was good. Um, yeah, I think there were a lot of good things, you know, that happened and came out of it. What I don't think was good was that, as far as I know, soldiers who left the war and left the army weren't debriefed um, and we we all know about post-traumatic stress and those sort of things and 
a lot of the boys didn't survive. They died afterwards in civilian life. I don't know if it's coincidental, but, you know, one does wonder. There's, some of them, I think, struggle to adapt. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And it's also so that there was like a silence. I remember yeah. coming back and nobody was interested, which is one of the reasons yeah. of this channel. And we have Franz uh, von Staden, the psychologist, who is also a free to battalion member. Mm. He's also uh, giving us about once a month one of his psychology, psychology lessons. Mm. I wish to urge anybody here, if you're listening here and you you feel like you, you can't cope, write to me. I will get you into contact with France. He'll help you, even for free, if needs be. Don't let it become an issue. Don't let it cost you your, your marriage. It certainly cost me a marriage. So don't, don't make those, those mistakes again. Don't, it's, it's not a sissy thing if you feel not 100%. Not everybody was, you know, special forces in those guys. Most of us were just normal people. Yeah. It's a very, very tough thing going to war. I don't know what it's like. I never went to war, but I can't begin to imagine what it must be like. I really can't. Have you any regret of accepting that offer to go to uh, Buffalo? It changed your life? It did change my life because I met my husband there. <laughs> And sadly, that um, marriage came to an end. I, I think if I didn't speak about it, it would be like the elephant in the room. Um, uh, and he was a very exciting and dashing young man, dare I say it. Um, but uh, we ended up having very different worldviews. And um, so we have two beautiful children. Um, but it didn't, it, 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 we didn't last, yeah. Well, it's, it's sad, but I know you're happily married now to your vet, so you're yes. covered both sides of the world, actually. Yeah. Yes, and also, you learn, <laughs> through suffering, you <laughs> learn so much, you know. I think the two big cauldrons that we learn through our great love and great suffering so i've had both <laughs> well you know looking back i always say that the children need a soul and uh, there's two lovely kids out of it where are they now they're in cape town um yeah they are the joy of my life any grandkids? No. Furry ones. But we can always Dogs hope. And... Sorry? But we can always hope. Yes, you know, and I don't, if, if there are, there are, and if there aren't, there aren't. You know, I don't, I don't have a, I just want my children to be happy and to, um, if they do have children, one day that it should be at the right time, et cetera, et cetera. And if the right time is never to have them, that's also fine. That's a very good way of looking at it. Mm. But I know something here. Yeah, it's astonishing to me, but there will be three to battalion members watching you right now. And uh, do you have any message for any former member who's watching you? Gosh. Well, I loved being there. It was a, uh, I was young and I was healthy. I'm now sitting with two replaced fake hips and, and who are Blutruck and <laughs> all those sort of things. <laughs> um, I was very happy there and I learned a lot. Um, and I, I loved, I loved the guys. They were great. They were a good bunch. Uh, there was one ex foreign legion guy who I was a bit scared of, and I minded my P's and Q's with. But apart from that, they were great. Well, I'm sure we're going to ask also what happened to you afterwards because I might have lost contact with you 
after you left Buffalo, if you can just tell us quickly until you retired. Okay, so after I left Buffalo, I went to one military hospital and worked in the labor ward there and then moved to Cape Town. And Jim followed and we got married and we lived there for a year and then we went to Lesotho and then we went to Port Elizabeth where I had my first child, started working again in a hospice and then we went to Pretoria, worked in a hospice there and then Jim left the Defence Force and he went to work for... De Beers and Kimberley and then he and I separated there and I went back to Cape Town and spent um, 24 years I think working at Hrutuskia and raising my children and then about 10 11 years ago I met Mark my current husband and um we got married and he has two daughters. So I have two bonus daughters and two of our own, uh, of my own. And we retired to Barrydale about a year ago, year and a bit. And if there are any three, two guys coming through here and they know me and they want to pull in for a, a bed or a meal or a coffee, I live at 22 Hellier Street. They are so welcome. Do you think it was a brave decision for you as a young woman, blonde, blue-eyed, off to the field, off to this base in the nowhere, middle of nowhere, secrecy? Think it's a brave deed? No, I don't. It was just a big, exciting adventure. You know, there's nothing brave about it, I have to be honest. It was, um, it was fun. I wasn't the soldier going into war, you know. I um, my war was very different. It was it wasn't a war, you know. Just being in the bush and yeah, was nothing brave about it whatsoever. Was I promise you? I'd love to say it was, but it wasn't. <laughs> well, we've come to the end. I'm sure we will hear again from you, perhaps of Esther, perhaps you yourself, and. Uh, Thank you for your time. Thank you for your service. I know you don't think uh, it was brave or anything, but let me tell you, I, think, I yeah. think it was uh, something special. Last question before we leave. My wife wants to know hair. How did you do your hair while you're out there in the middle of... Um, I've got curly hair, so it was easy. It was just wash and wear. Yeah. It was... Uh... My hair's never been an issue. I don't do anything to it. I just wash it <laughs> and cut yeah. it from time to time. Yeah. Well, that's where you see the practical side of a nurse. Yeah. Jennifer, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Chris. And for all of you out there, if you want to come and tell your story to us, please, you're welcome. Just contact me. It's really not difficult. It's really not hard. You were important. Come and tell us before you know, before you secrets and your glorious life you know, passes with you. So until we meet again, God bless.